When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. It's interesting because it, there is some stats out there and, and some research that basically show, you, they ask you why people like sugar. You know, there's that dopamine hit. It's as addictive as heroin. But they've actually done some studies on what happens when somebody makes a big purchase. And it turns out those same triggers in your brain, they light up. You get a hit of feel good energy when you buy that new car, when you make that big purchase, when you go on that vacation. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Are you the decision maker in your company? Consider this. For the first time in decades, there's a better option for a corporate card and spend management platform. Meet Ramp, the only corporate card and spend management system designed to help you spend less money so you can make more. Most corporate credit cards offer points as incentives, but those points amount to less than their worth in real cash value. Ramp's business cards offer you cash back, real money in your pocket. Plus, you control who spends what with each vendor. And Ramp's software collects and verifies receipts automatically, which means you'll stop wasteful spending and close your books in hours instead of days. Businesses that use Ramp add up to 3.5% to their bottom line the first year. If you're a decision maker, adding Ramp could be one of the best decisions you've ever made. And now get $250 when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash easy. Ramp.com slash easy. R-A-M-P dot com slash easy. Currents issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members of DIC terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the show. It is so good to have you here. All right, I need you to be honest with me. Who has been guilty of a little revenge spending this year? I certainly know I have that that dopamine hit is such a real thing when it comes to spending. And the truth is, is that most of us haven't felt in control during the pandemic. So now you need to spend, you need to spend, and you need to spend some more. However, is that a good thing for our bank accounts? Maybe, maybe not. As our guest, Dr. Jamie Peters, Assistant Dean and Professor of Accounting, Finance, and Economics at Maryville University says... If you've saved up and you want to buy something, great. But the problem is when you start stretching yourself to spend just to feel good again. In this episode, Jamie shares what revenge spending is, how you can balance spending with achieving your other money goals, and what you need to think about if we're headed for a recession this year. Let's start talking money. We're talking about this idea of revenge spending. And to me, it kind of sounds like we have like our ex's credit card and we're on this spending spree for for a breakup. What exactly is revenge spending? And should we do any revenge spending or is it is it bad for us? (laughs) Well, it's actually really interesting because it's probably misnamed. The idea of revenge spending is the idea that the uh, pandemic has limited our ability to spend money. 
We are stuck at home. We're ordering things online, but we can't go up and have all of those experiences that Mm. we wanted to have. We're not going on that trip. We're not doing that vacation. We're not buying ski equipment because we can't go skiing. Um, And so it is that type of thing that is what was referred to as revenge spending because now people are simply saying, you know what? I don't care. I'm sticking it to the quote unquote man. We don't know who that is, but I'm (laughs) going to go ahead and do it. And um, I'm taking my revenge for these past two years and I'm going to spend my money the way I want it to do what I want. Interesting. Yeah, I I would be amiss to say if I haven't probably done a little revenge spending myself. Uh, We've all just come through collectively we're still in the midst, but collectively very difficult couple of years. And we get this itch to to spend money, like you said, go places and do things that we couldn't do. What do you think it is about human nature that makes us long for, quote unquote, like getting back to normal? It is about getting back to normal. It's about feeling in control because I think that is the issue that we've had. We haven't felt in control. We had plans that got interrupted. We had saved for that vacation that now wasn't going to happen. And some people chose to spend it a different way. You know, I bought a hot tub instead of going to a beach because I had the money That is where revenge spending goes from being really good to potentially a problem, actually. Hmm. Okay, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, how do we know, A, if we're revenge spending, and then how do we know whether it's, it's for a good purchase, or maybe it's not a, you know, an intentional purchase that we should be making? So a couple of things to think about. Um, The first is that, If it makes you feel good and you can afford it and it was something you planned, it's perfectly fine. Go for it. You're not risking anything. It should feel just like you save for vacation before the pandemic as you're saving for a vacation now. The problem comes is when people start stretching themselves because they feel like they need to get the spending in now before some other disaster happens. Mm, And that's where we get into some serious problems. So I give you the example of the hot tub. If we switch it to a puppy dog instead, hey, I want and I spent a thousand dollars on this really beautiful puppy dog. She now costs me about two hundred dollars a month because of vet bills and doggy daycare and all the other things that I do for this lovely puppy dog. And I now have a higher level of permanent spending. That's where it can really cause problems because my next time I want to do something, I have a lower budget that's free. Okay, so um, I am guilty of the puppy dog spending. (laughs) (laughs) Just a few months ago, we got we got a puppy. Her name's Winnie. She's adorable, but yes, she's already cost money. But uh, what I did do is I did get pet insurance and I did set aside a fund before we knew we were going to get her so that we were already kind of saving for her. But yes, I will definitely attest to that something like a puppy can be can be very expensive even if you just go down and adopt a pet. We got Trixie the very first week of the pandemic. So I am <laughs> guilty of it as well. She's my lovely Shiba Inu. Um, and she is a blast, but yeah, she's pricey and, um, it, it is, it can become an issue. So how do you then, um, like think through these money decisions you're going to make or like, how do you, maybe the better question is like, how do you have a pause moment where you could separate a little bit of like the emotion with what you want to spend your money on with the actual like practicality of it? Oh, if I could answer that with like a hundred percent effectiveness, the world would be so different. Uh, there's so much emotion involved with money. It's actually a really big problem in the world because we don't talk about money. I mean, this podcast is awesome because we're talking about money. We're bringing in what is a taboo subject out into the open and talking about real life consequences of this situation. So, how do you sit there and you take a pause? Well. You have to stop and think about the budget. When it's small revenge spending, you know, you're sitting there and you're saying, no, I am going to go ahead and make this $50 purchase and you can afford it. It's not that big of a deal. It's when you're trying to commit to something bigger. You need to make sure you have that plan A. You're going to go ahead and buy that vacation, but you may decide to budget an extra $200 for vacation insurance now. 
so that you have an mm. out in case something happens. We're starting to look at these things a lot different. You mentioned pet insurance. That didn't exist 20 years ago. We're talking about, you know, insurance for traveling and you've got all these ways to get create safety nets in case something bad happens. So just digging a little bit deeper into that, you talk about money being this taboo subject. Obviously, one of the reasons why I started the show was because I wanted money to be something where we could just have these conversations, almost like we're just sitting around, you know, a casual conversation or having a coffee or whatever it may be. We're talking about the highs, the lows of money, and we're normalizing it to some extent. But why do you think... Why do you think we leave out talking about the behavioral mental side of money? Like I, I find that in so many different articles, even a lot of podcasts about money, it's it's so much about the how to's, and the how to's are great, but there is a lot of uh, stuff and information you need to think about and process through before you even get to those. It's actually really interesting because I think money is one of those last topics that people are afraid to talk about. You know, people now talk much more openly about sexuality, yes. um, gender identity, all these things that used to be taboo have now really become open and honest. But a lot of those are things that you can, not all of them, but a lot of them are things that you can physically see. We talk about otherly abled individuals. We talk about how somebody wants to live their lives, but those often have physical appearances associated with them. Money is something that people feel like is hidden. And it's not really, you can see the difference between somebody who has a lot of money and who doesn't have any money. But the reality is that people feel like they are hiding it. I mean, my kids probably don't know how much I make and I'm a finance professor. I should be talking about this, but it's still hard for me to overcome the idea that we were always like, shh, shh you don't want to talk about it because right. you don't want to make somebody else feel bad that you may have something that they don't. And by making it something that's so crazy hard to talk about, we also then limit the education and the ability to express the pains and joys that come from it. So, I mean, are there, are there any solutions? Is there a way that we, we change this? There's a couple of things we need to do. Number one, we do have to have more of these podcasts. We need to talk about money. We need to talk about money to our kids. We need to talk openly about when we have struggles with it, as well as the victories that we have with it. And then we need to start advocating much more in the educational setting. We do we do computer literacy. We talk about, you know, internet safety. We have reading, you know, literacy. We have math literacy in, in schools, but we don't often get uh, educational literacy, or literacy on financial topics. We don't get financial literacy. We get a little bit of consumer act every once in a while, but how many people know how to set up their own 401k? How many people know how to set up their IRA? It's this huge skill set that we don't really talk or teach. And it's, it's a huge gap in our education system. I think um, I might have this wrong, but I think it's is it now 21 or 22 states that have some sort of personal finance requirement, I think, in high school? Um, I know that I would have loved to have had something, some sort of framework, even if I forgot it all after. I would hope that maybe something would be retained in there. But I, I often say, you know, we, we go to school and we learn sex ed. You know, I didn't have a sex ed class and you learn how to put the condom on the banana and all, and all that <laughs> there stuff. There you go. Uh, so we learn that, but we don't learn about money, which is inevitably we're we're all going to have to deal with. Like we can't escape it. And it just has always been really uh, head scratchy for me. Like how is this ethical that that money is handled this way and not taught about? And and I, I don't know if it's, I wish I had an answer of why it is so taboo. And it's just probably be the difference between the haves and the have nots. The haves don't want to talk about it because they want the have nots to not ri you know, raise up right. and, and argue and stuff like that. The idea of the, of the elites and items like that, it's, it is one of the items that just isn't up front. We've been talking about so many other things and there's so many injustices in this world. Money is almost always at the root of almost all of them, not all of them, yes. but a lot of them. And um, it's just still not talked about. I mean, we want to talk about Ukraine. You can talk about what's going on with um, 
uh, education. You can talk about what's going on in the society. You can talk about uh, COVID-19. You can talk about all these things that are so emotionally charged. And most of the time, you can trace it back to money. I agree 100%. If you just dig a little bit down, (laughs) it's always there, right? It's always there. (laughs) So I want to take a little bit of the kind of the other side where the economy is right now. There was a market report that was out today by the NPD group, and it says as prices continue to rise, more than eight to 10 consumers are planning to rethink or even reduce their product spending in the next six months. So there seems to be this tug of war between consumers' desire to buy what they want and also to maybe make some concessions based on their wallets or just what's going on uh, with the with the economy. What do you think about this? I think it's the logical response to massive inflation. Notice that that article said that they're going to reduce the amount of product they have, not the amount of money they're spending. Ah. And that's the issue. So, you know, it, it's, I talk, when I talk about originally the whole idea of time value of money, I talk about the fact that in 1960, $5 could buy 33 hamburgers. And that today you can buy three McDonald's hamburgers for $5. You know, it's, it's inflation and, and stuff like that. And that's really what that article is suggesting is that I can only buy two hamburgers now. I'm not, I'm still spending the same amount of money. And, and that's, that's going to hurt the economy is going to hurt the economy because we're going to be selling less, even if profits on a nominal basis are going to go up. And that's, well, actually, it's not even profits, it's revenue. And that is a bigger issue. So we've got the stock market falling apart. We've got inflation hitting. We've got consumers changing their behavior. And all of it is just going to kind of roll up into what could be one seriously economic disaster of 2022. (laughs) <laughs> so we are we, we need to buckle our seatbelts, right? <laughs> <laughs> Make some plans is a better way to put it. Everybody needs to revisit their budgets more often. So typically people talk about the fact, check in every six months, check in every year, make sure you're meeting your financial advisor once a year to see how you're doing on your plan. That's not possible when you've got 8% inflation. You need to be checking your budget on a monthly basis or a two-month basis. You should be checking in with your financial advisor on a quarterly basis instead of a half-yearly basis at this point because things are changing so rapidly right now. And where the money is going, of course, it's not all even. A lot of the inflation is really being felt at the gas pump. And then it's being felt in the food market, but it's not being felt quite as much in, in the durable goods, you know, the, the stuff that you, uh, you know, your toasters and stuff like that. Actually, it's harder to find the toasters because of other right. issues. <laughs> right. They, and they can't get imported. So yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a completely different issue there. But, um, uh, but that, that is, um, is something you need to think about is you may end up having to reduce your entertainment budget to be able to increase your food budget. You know, you, you're going to want to start grouping your, your errands so that you're only going out once rather than three times a week to do grocery shopping because it's it's expensive to just drive. So you're you're talking about inflation and I know that everyone listening has heard the word or or feeling it, but I think there's still maybe this this little bit disconnect of like what inflation actually is and what does it actually mean to us as just everyday people, consumers. So T- tell us a little bit more about inflation. Like, what do we need to think about kind of going into this summer? So inflation is really just the idea that your dollar can buy less product. That that really is what is happening. So um, what, at 8%, it's now costing me, it, what used to cost me a dollar to buy the candy bar is now costing me a dollar and eight cents. And those type of things, if everything goes up by 8%, everything gets more expensive. My salary, which really hasn't changed because that's always a lag, you know, is no longer going to buy as many items, which means I won't have as much money to put away at the end of the month, or I won't be able to save for this, or I may be short. Um, Mm, And as we go into the summer, you you need to think about the fact that gas prices tend to go up. So we're going to have to, you know, schedule it. You need to recheck that budget for your vacation, for instance. If you decided to not do a flying vacation, but you wanted to do a driving vacation, that's now more expensive than what you probably were looking at when you priced it back in December. And um, so there's a little bit of that. The other issue is going to be to prep for the coming winter, because one of the issues is that we're seeing a lot of inflation in 
energy prices. And that's going to cause some real issues this winter when we start talking about heating homes and things like that. So you need to be prepping now. Okay, I like that. Like we can't just sort of set our numbers and forget it. Like we need to we need to be in our numbers on some sort of regular basis and um you know, kind of comparing against whatever we set up in our budget versus whatever is actually like really happening when we go to the grocery store, or when we pay our utilities because we need to you know, make some alterations in order to make sure we can reach all our goals, right? Absolutely. And also self-advocate. I mean, this is combined with the great resignation. And it's looking like one of the reasons people have been resigning from jobs isn't to leave the workforce as much as to move to another place that's going to pay them more. And Mm. so self-advocating at your job to say, hey, there's 8% inflation. My budget isn't going as far. You need to pay me because this is a good job market. I could find another job. It's more expensive for you to have me leave and you retrain somebody else than just give me the raise. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. 
The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. So, are it, I mean, is it okay for us to say things like that to our employers? Do we want to maybe put a little soft spin on it? But I mean, is that, that basically the message? That is the message that most people are going to need to give. Yeah. Um, and, and it does need to be, needs to be done dip- diplomatically, <laughs> we'll say. Right. Um, but it, it is something that is necessary. And a lot of employers are recognizing that. Even employers that are having financial issues themselves is also recognizing that the, that the, uh, their employees are having problems and they are pushing to, give those raises and they may not make it all the way to inflation, but they're getting close as they can. Um, mm-hmm. So there is some recognition out there, but it is a lag measure. Your, your, your wages go up after the prices have moved. And, you know, we've been talking about inflation. There's really two sets of inflation that we should be talking about. There is the CPI, the consumer price index, which is what you and I see when we go to the grocery store. How much does it cost us to live? But there's also the producer's price index, the PPI. And the PPI is actually even higher than the CPI right now. So the CPI was, you know, tapped out about 8%. The PPI tapped out at 11%, I believe. And so the result is, is that the companies who are making the products are also really feeling the pinch on the stuff that they buy in order to make the products. They're raising our prices, but they're actually Mm -hmm. getting their prices raised on them faster. So profits are dropping. There's just so many impacts at the same time. So that's time. like what creates the domino effect, right? And maybe the, then the stock market gets a little wonky. I mean, it all is is interconnected. High inflation actually does start becoming a self, a, like a, a, a wheel is the best way, a circle that just feeds upon itself. And so the Fed's job is to break that, break that cycle. Because what happens is, you know, if you have inputs that go into a company that's increased in price, they turn around and increase the prices of their goods, which then hurts their employee or all the employees and the consumers because everything's more expensive. So the consumers and employees have to go ask for a raise. That increases the price to the company. Do you see how it just becomes this circle that feeds upon itself? And so there has to be something that breaks that cycle. And what the Fed has is interest rates. That's their kind of tool to break that cycle. And what it is, and it happened in the 1980s, is Paul Volcker, the chairman at the time, purposely put us into recession. And where it, okay. oh yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> it was they knew it was going to happen is the best way to put it. Um, it caused in um, uh, unemployment to rise, but by having unemployment <laughs> spike, he broke that cycle of the wages needed to be increased. So um. I have to re-increase the prices. He broke that circle. I don't know how it's going to get broken this time. I hope it's not the same way because we have this really strong um job market because we have we have all these job openings and so that's actually going to make it harder for the fed to do this to break that cycle because if that's where they they want to break it in the same place as they did last time that would suggest they need to ruin the job market and that's not happening anytime soon which which brings us back to revenge spending right is it does even if even if we have a job like I mean, I don't know any job now that is 100% secure. Uh, things happen. So being prepared financially is, is a smart way or just at least being on top of, of what's going on with your money. And to, talking about companies, they reap benefits as well for all of us out there revenge spending and, uh, you know, overspending, doing whatever we're doing, where we're trying to take back a little bit of control, you know, thinking about this from a different vantage point. Why do companies like our revenge spending? Well, travel companies love revenge spending. I mean, the airlines have come out and said, hey, we're going to make new numbers. And we've got so all our, our planes are completely full because everybody's decided it's time to get back to the real world. They're all revenge spending. I can set record prices on my, my airline tickets. So they're really loving it. Hotels are filling back up. They're really loving it. 
Um, the people who don't really like it, I got to tell you, are the people who are going to be on that marginal part of the business. You know, the food companies and stuff like that, they could care less if we revenge spend because they have that inelastic demand. Um, but they are much more concerned, again, about that inflation side and said, what's that going to do to their profits, etc. And the revenge spending is is great. And um, I don't know how many are, um, ads you've recently seen about, has it been a while? You should consider going <laughs> All here. All the time, yeah. Yes. It, they're playing into it. They're feeding into the psychology. You know, it's interesting. We started talking about finance, you know, 50 years ago. It was all about numbers and there's no emotion in finance. I love it because two plus two is four. It's not two plus two is, um, what do I feel like it should be today? Um, but now we've got this huge um, world of behavioral economics, behavioral finance, and we recognize just how much emotion is going into spending. So we have to break a little bit of that. We do have to step back and say, am I buying this because I want to? Am I buying this because I feel like I should? And can I afford it even if the first two were two were ticked? Yeah, I mean, talking about talking about emotions, I, I think what you're saying is to to take like a pause moment as best as you can and try to have at least go through that, you know, three sets of questions. But for those of us listening that are really new to this idea of like what emotions might be impacting my revenge spending or just my spending in general, what do we need to know about the the role that the emotions play? You know, it's interesting because it, there is some stats out there and, and some research that basically show you, they ask you why people like sugar. You know, there's that dopamine hit. It's as addictive as heroin. But they've actually done some studies on what happens when somebody makes a big purchase. And it turns out those same triggers in your brain, they light up. You get a hit of feel good energy when you buy that new car, when you make that big purchase, when you go on that vacation. Um, so there is quite a bit. Our own body is designed to get excited and, mm. and feel good when we've spent that money. It's only right. afterwards when the credit card bill comes that we're like, oh, <laughs> you know, and it's actually interesting because because of the use of credit, we actually can delay the bad part and really enjoy the good part um, at the beginning. And so mm. this is an entire field that really does need to be looked at. And it's being exploited, to be honest, by companies. They're purposely looking at that. Let me give you 0% financing. Let me do these different types of, of payment plans. You know, you can now buy airplane tickets on payment plans. You can finance almost anything. And it's crazy. Um, and it's all because of that exact thing. Get the dopamine hit now and then, you know, we'll trickle out the consequences over the next year. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The hosts, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks, where they explain how you get started right away. And back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Nainen, the host of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future, and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. 
Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. Daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. Mm. It makes me so frustrated. Uh, so, so thinking about that, thinking that companies are really playing into our revenge spending and our everything, our emotions, what are some money steps we can take even just over maybe like the next 30 days to get ourselves prepared for, for summer and kind of all the things that are going to be flying at us so we can be more intentional with our spending? So number one, if you are planning on taking a trip, which a lot of people do, reprice everything. Go back, relook at the budget that you created and make sure that that is there. Number two, start looking at your budget again and say, we've got 8% annual inflation right now. What is my budget going to look like if I, if I eke it out 1% or 2% per month for the next three months? How is that going to affect it? If I have to increase my grocery spending, by 2% every month in June, July, and August. Where am I going to be by the time September hits? I know that, you know, how am I going to deal with the switch between spending for my air conditioning, which is electricity, compared to, you know, spending for my heating, which is gas, and that price is going to be much, much higher for the gas, and trying to make a plan. Looking out at your budget and not just putting in the same number month after month after month, you've got to start growing those numbers and seeing where's the breaking point. Well, you're obviously very passionate about what you talk about, what you teach. You're assistant dean and professor of accounting, finance, and economics at Maryville University. Uh, you, you talk about money probably all day long, every day. What excites you about helping others really identify revenge spending or learn about these areas of finance? So I love being a professor because if I can teach one person and that person talks to another person, I've now gotten an impact on two or three people. Being able to explain to them that this taboo subject really isn't scary and that this is a skill everybody needs to know. And it's something that we can get a grasp on. There are methods and ways of hitting the reset button or finding a path out of the darkness. All of those type of things that happen in finance. Um, and they can happen. And then you can plan for this beautiful retirement life, this beautiful future. It's all about delayed gratification, which is something that we don't do anymore. Um, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, know. Uh, I, get, I get that all the time. Um, you know, it is hard to see that the small changes today will grow. But when you start putting numbers in front of people and I start showing them how the accounting and the economics and the finances work, their eyes open. And I get, and I get a lot of people who sit there and tell me, oh my gosh, I was going to go do this and now I'm not, or I'm now going to go do this. I love it when I get a student who says, I just opened my first brokerage account. I put in a hundred dollars. That's all I had. I'm like, well, great. That's a start. Now you can learn and this is going to be great because it, it, it just takes practice. Yeah. It doesn't have to be big money, it, but it, it's something that um, I love being able to do for people to get the advantages I didn't have. Do you find, are there any like common, um, maybe like common areas where people don't know a lot about whether it is uh, opening an IRA or whatever that subject might be that you really want people to like, you really need to know X, Y, and Z about money. Like you have to know these things. My favorite thing to talk about soon, there's two things I'll say. Number one, talking about putting money in your 401k immediately upon either graduating high school and starting your first job or graduating college and starting that first real job where you have never experienced having your own money, where you've never, you know, when a $50,000 job looks like something that is huge because you're used to being a student living on $15,000 in the dorm, eating ramen every night, understanding the impact of 
putting a lot of that money away in your 401k now and how beneficial that is, that's one of my favorite ways to talk about it. The other thing that I find that students don't understand or all, the general public is the impact of insurance. Stu people get insurance they don't need or they get insurance or they don't get enough insurance that they do need. Um, and then they find that when disaster happens, it is, um, it is really, really bad when they could have been prevented. Yeah. I mean, talking about those taboos, I feel like insurance is another taboo that somehow we feel like, oh, that's the snake oil charmer or the used car salesman. And so we should just avoid it altogether. But I think I love what I love really about about what you do. And, and I, I'm confident it's what you what you teach about is if we learn all of these things, then we can pick and choose what works for us at whatever life stage we're in, we can really empower ourselves when it comes to money. You're absolutely right. So there are, I'm not suggesting that everybody should cover everything all the time. A lot of times that high deductible, kind of riskier health insurance, it makes complete sense for a healthy 21 year old male. Go for it. Do it. You've got that right risk profile where go ahead and take that chance. Right. But the, you know, minimum liability car insurance, don't be that stupid. Cover yourself as well as the person that you potentially could hit. And they don't understand the basics of what the difference is between full coverage and liability. They just see that one costs $200 a month and one costs $50 a month and they want to save the money. Right. So knowledge really is power. <laughs> Absolutely. I like it. Yeah. That well, should be a coin I, you know, somewhere. <laughs> it should, right? It really should. Um, you you talked about this wheel of inflation and how you don't know what's going to happen, but something's going to have to happen. Where do you see the economy just in general headed, say, maybe by the end of this year? Like, are there any bright spots on the horizon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that I laugh. That laugh says it all. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I've actually had this conversation just yesterday um, and, and with my uh, good friend and said, no, no, there are bright spots on the horizon. The reality is, is that all of these things that have happened have spurred people to figure out ways to become more efficient, to save money over time, how to cut out excess spending. There are going to be a lot of people who come out of this kind of recession that we're we're in a recession it hasn't been called yet you gotta have two quarters of consecutive negative gdp growth we're in the second quarter to be honest or we'll hear that announcement soon is my guess but um uh well they're gonna come out stronger companies are gonna come out stronger because they're gonna say you know what we're short workers we have to find ways to automate some things and they're gonna find new methods new things are gonna be discovered because of that and that's the bright spot that i can see I see it not as a bright spot this year. It's going to be really rough. But when we come out of it, we will likely have discovered new things that are going to make this nation and this world a bit stronger. Well, Jamie, this has been so, so incredibly informative. Uh, I just love learning more about revenge spending. And I, and I love how you talk about our emotions with money, because I think it's really important for everyone listening, even just to take like a pause moment and just think about how your emotions are playing into how you're intending to spend your money this summer. And maybe you make a change and maybe you don't, but it doesn't matter, right? It's you create this, this awareness point. And I think that's what's so important. I would love for you to tell everyone listening, if they want to connect more, they want to learn more from you, where do they go? Oh, you can go to maryville.edu and you will find information all about me as well as the different classes and items that we offer. So we do teach personal finance and items like that that you can find on our website. Even knowing the facts around revenge spending, I still find myself saying, well, I deserve that because I couldn't spend money on things a few years ago. I don't know if you can relate, but that is certainly what I was feeling Prior to this episode and, and talking to Jamie, I just have this deeper understanding. Really what, what happens in our brain around money, it's so important to be aware of because we can convince ourselves of anything. We can convince ourselves that we need to spend money or that we shouldn't spend money or we deserve to spend money. And again, it's not that you can't revenge spend, but what Jamie was sharing was to spend with some intentionality and planning as best as possible, of course. After all, we've all lived through a rough couple of years, and it's okay to cut loose when needed. 
I will say for myself, my pup Winnie that I talked about earlier in the episode was definitely a revenge spending purchase, but I will never take it back. It was money well spent. So you don't ever need to be hard on yourself. If you enjoyed this episode, go on, share it with someone right now who needs a little relief from feeling like they did some revenge spending as well. As always, I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode.